And so here we are uh, in, uh, come here into, into the end of November. Uh, we got a wide variety of different COVID-19 vaccines, including traditional as well as new approaches that are under development. I'm just gonna give you a quick primer of the different types of vaccines that we're looking at. There's types of vaccines that we're familiar with like whole inactivated, that's just where you take the pathogen and you kill it and then you inject it. Uh, our current flu vaccine is an example of whole inactivated vaccine. There's also live attenuated vaccines. That's where you take the pathogen and you uh, introduce mutations that causes it to be weakened. So it's able to replicate a couple of times in your body, but it doesn't cause disease. Uh, there's a lot of vaccines that are live attenuated, like the measles vaccine is a good example. By far, the majority of our vaccines are whole and back to inactivated or live attenuated. We also have recombinant protein subunit vaccines. That's where you take a portion of the virus, for example, that spike protein, and you produce that as a protein in, in the laboratory. You preorify that and you inject that. Uh, an example of that is like our hepatitis B vaccine. But the new kids on the block here that we're talking about for COVID-19, these are these uh, vaccines called a recombinant viral vector vaccine. That's where you take uh, an irrelevant virus. For example, for COVID-19, that would be an adenovirus. Adenoviruses are harmless viruses to humans. But what we do is we take out some of their genetic material and replace it with a gene to express the spike protein from COVID-19. And then that virus helps that uh, protein to get delivered into the body. And then your cells are able to produce that protein and induce an immune response. The other new kids on the block, that's the DNA and RNA vaccines or what we collectively call nucleic acid vaccines. And there have a lot of similarity to the recombinant viral vectors, but they differ in that they don't use a virus to deliver the genetic material into your cells. Instead, we use other methods, which I'll talk about in a little bit, to actually deliver genetic material into your cells and then it instructs your own cells to start to produce the vaccine. So you have all these different types of vaccines that are in production. And you can see there's all kinds of companies developing COVID-19 vaccines based on many of these different strategies. As is common with vaccines, you start an exploratory phase. There's all kinds of different types of vaccines that you initially start with. And then you proceed towards preclinical and phase one clinical trials. And that really kind of narrows the field eventually till you have only a handful of vaccines that are now being tested in phase one, two and clinical trials. And here's the current landscape then of our leading vaccines in phase three trials. You've already heard about uh, Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, there's also a couple other uh, companies coming up, uh, the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. So Moderna and BioNTech, are, are, are Pfizer are developing <clears throat> RNA vaccines. And you can see, uh, of course, we're all familiar with the fact that they looked at their uh, uh, data recently and uh, had some initial promising results indicating their vaccines uh, are looking to be greater than 90% effective. And so that means if you look here on these little uh, symbols here that they are going to be filing for emergency use authorization. And we may be seeing some of these first vaccines distributed before the end of December. We also have these other two types of vaccines. These are the recombinant viral vectors based on adenovirus by AstraZeneca and J&J. &J. And we're looking at those uh, uh, folks actually looking at their preliminary phase three clinical dry, trial uh, data probably by the end of December, beginning of January, and then seeing uh, perhaps those particular vaccines being released in the early quarter two and quarter one of 2021. So this is exciting. This actually graph was uh, developed prior to uh, Moderna and Pfizer looking at their early data. What happened is that we suddenly had a surge in COVID-19 and that surge in COVID-19 resulted in an increase in number of cases that occurred in their phase three trials. So that meant that they actually reached some of their uh, benchmarks to demonstrate efficacy in their vaccines a bit earlier. So we're now about three to four weeks ahead of this particular timeline in terms of seeing some of these vaccines rolled out. I do wanna emphasize though, there are going to be some limits of these lead vaccines. One of the things you probably have heard about is the issue with a cold chain. Cold chain means that's what's required to be able to distribute a vaccine uh, to, to uh, uh, maintain its stability once it gets manufactured. In the case of Pfizer's vaccine, you've heard that it requires storage of ultra cold, and this could have some limitations in terms of where it could be distributed and where it could be shipped. 
Uh, Moderna's is a little better in the fact it re doesn't require the ultra cold, but it still is dependent on refrigeration and a freezer to maintain its stability and distribution. And that can pose a problem for distribution worldwide. We're also quite not sure in, uh, in terms of how well all of these vaccines are gonna work in all demographics. We're starting to see some initial data from Pfizer and Moderna indicating that these vaccines seem to be looking good in the elderly people. As you, many of you may know, vaccines don't usually always work as well in the elderly uh, due to their immune um, immunosenescence. Um, so we're gonna be looking at whether these vaccines are actually very effective in the el elderly. We do know so far the adenovirus-based vaccines, they generally are less potent in the elder. And that's because as we uh, get older, we're actually exposed to adenoviruses just in the environment in general. In general, as I mentioned, adenoviruses are pretty harmless to us, but we get exposed to them. We generate immune responses against them. And that immune response can actually interfere with the ability of these vaccines to work. The other potential issue is we don't know how durable the immunity is going to be uh, by the, induced by these vaccines. Ideally, what we're going to need is vaccines that are going to provide immunity for at least a year. And finally, most of these vaccines require multiple doses, at least a prime and a booster immunization. That means it's going to take between six to eight weeks from the time you get your first dose before you have immunity against the virus. And so what we really want, if you think about what we want for an effective pandemic vaccine, we want a vaccine that's gonna induce immunity quickly. Ideally one dose, but two is okay. We also, and I'll get a little bit more into this uh, as we talk about, uh, but we want a vaccine that not just only induces antibody, but T cell responses, because we think T cell responses are also going to be an important component for protection. As I mentioned, we want it to be effective across different demographics, including the elderly. And finally, to be fast and cost effective for scale up and stable room temperature. mRNA vaccines produced by Pfizer as well as Moderna, they're not necessarily very fast and cost effective to scale up. And of course, as I mentioned, they're not stable at room temperature. So at here at University of Washington, we're designing what we would call the next generation vaccines to address potential limits of those first wave of vaccines. And what we're looking at is trying to make these vaccines stable at room temperature, more effective than the elderly, induce long-term immunity, achieve uh, uh, that immunity in a single dose and uh, technology developed in my lab to make, uh, to make delivery needle free, that could enable self-administration, which could increase uh, vaccine coverage. And so let me just return back to these DNA and RNA vaccines, because that's what we're working on here. Uh, these are, as I mentioned, the new kids on the block. Um, and what they do is they instruct their own cells to produce vaccine antigens. So we have DNA vaccines and we have RNA vaccines. And you've heard a lot about the RNA vaccines, but I wanna remind you that there is this concept called DNA vaccines as well. And DNA differs a little bit from RNA. They both actually are genetic material that gets inserted into your cells and then instructs your cells to produce the vaccine. But the way DNA differs is that that DNA vaccine actually has to get delivered into the nucleus, then it makes messenger and RNA, and then it makes proteins. Whereas RNA vaccines, they don't need to get into the, into the nucleus of the cell, they just need to get into the cytoplasm and then they can induce uh, immune responses. So both DNA and RNA vaccines are very effective in inducing both antibody as well as T cell responses. They can both be rapidly designed and produced in terms of uh, needing only the genetic uh, sequence of the pathogen. There are some differences, which I'll get into a little bit here. But first, let me just explain to you why I think antibody as well as T cell responses are going to be important. Both of these types of immune responses are needed to work together to fight against SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we talk, already talked about how antibodies can block a virus from infecting a cell. But there's also this other type of immune uh, response called a cytotoxic T cell response. So what happens if your antibodies don't completely block all the virus from getting into your cells? Then you've got some cells that are infected with the virus. And what cytotoxic T cells do is they're able to find uh, and kill those cells. Uh, and so the, what they do is they clear the virus from your infection. Antibodies block it, cytotoxic T cells clear the infection. And then we have these helper T cells that are also important. And these helper T cells are absolutely necessary to generate the memory response to induce both antibody as well as T cell responses. And so when we talk about those second generation vaccines that were under development at UW here, is that we're looking at vaccines that are able to uh, induce those types of immune responses. So our vaccine platforms is one, is called a replicating RNA vaccine. So it's a little bit different than Moderna's and Pfizer's. 
and also delivery of DNA and RNA vaccines by this needle-free technology. There's a third uh, vaccine that's in, that we're developing in collaboration with Neil King and David Wiesler at the Institute of Protein Design. It's a nanoparticle recombinant protein vaccine that we're working with them on uh, both separately as well as a combination vaccine with our uh, vaccine platforms. But getting back to nucleic acid vaccines, these, uh, you know, when we first started working on those, and I've been working on them for nearly 30 years, they, they seem new to everybody else, but they're, they've been around actually for quite some time. Uh, when they first, we first started working on them 30 years ago, we immediately recognized their potential for rapid response to pandemics. And that's, as I mentioned, is because they require only the gene sequence. You don't need to actually uh, get the pathogen or purify the pathogen or create recombinant proteins. Instead, you just need the genetic material. And once that sequence is identified, you can make a DNA vaccine or you can make an RNA vaccine. And then as I mentioned, these has real significant advantages such as rapid scale up uh, for DNA vaccines or stable at room temperature and the capability of inducing both antibody as well as T cell responses. And so our uh, particular approach for an RNA vaccine differs from Pfizer's and Moderna's a little bit. It's called a self-amplifying replicon RNA vaccine. And the way it differs is that um, we, we, it's still are an RNA vaccine, but when it gets into the cell, what it does is it actually produces this replicase. And that replicase then uh, instructs the RNA to replicate itself. So we get multiple copies of the RNA in, uh, uh, copied within the cell and when you have multiple copies of RNA, that makes more vaccine antigen and more vaccine antigen means more of an immune response. So we anticipate that this particular vaccine is gonna be much more immunogenic than either Pfizer's or uh, Moderna's just because of its ability to copy itself multiple times. And so what we did is we, uh, similar to Many other groups, we immediately uh, got to work with a nucleic acid vaccine that, that uh, within a week after the full genome sequence of the virus had been identified, uh, which was on January 10th. By January 17th, we had a candidate RNA vaccine that we were already testing in animal models. And we are now here in the stage of a phase one human clinical trial. We went through formulation and manufacturing. But the main point here is that uh, the RNA and DNA vaccines are really some of the fastest vaccine strategies to, do, to develop against a pandemic. And that's why Pfizer and Moderna are really the first ones uh, you know, across a, crossing the finish line in terms of uh, developing a vaccine. And so when we talk about RNA and v DNA vaccines, uh, particularly RNA vaccines, one of the challenges is that they have to get into the cells. Remember that genetic material has to get in your cells to be able to instruct your cells to start making the vaccine. And so Moderna and Pfizer, what they do is they use what we call lipo nanoparticle. And the formulation requires the RNA to be encapsulated into this particle. Now, the issue with that is this is a complex process and it actually is quite slow to scale up. And it also requires a, a compound called cholesterol, which is actually currently in limited supply. So that could actually interfere with some of their scale up in, man, uh, in terms of the manufacturing. And as I talked about before, they have limited shelf life at room temperature. It really does need freezer, even in the case of Pfizer's ultra cold. So what we're doing is trying to develop a second generation vaccine and formulation that's going to address these potential limitations. And that, this particular vaccine uh, formulation in collaboration with HDT Bio here in Seattle uh, is called Lion. And this is a little bit different than your typical lipo nanoparticles in that the RNA isn't encapsulated. It actually is just put on the surface of the particle. And so that means you just need a simple mixing process and you get this rapid scale up. So what happens is we scale up the line formulations separate from the RNA formulation and then mix them right before they're actually used. And that allows for cost-effective scale up, quick scale up. And importantly, these two components separately have much longer shelf life. Uh, they're, they're stable at room temperature. And so we think this particular formulation is gonna provide an advantage where potentially uh, Moderna and Pfizer may not be able to uh, uh, scale up at the rate that's needed. And so we did test this particular vaccine in a non-human primate preclinical study. Uh, and we ended, I'm not gonna get into extensively into the data, uh, but it was published in Science Translational Medicine. And we showed that this vaccine was able to induce protective levels of antibody that has been sustained uh, in, in, uh, in the animals. Uh, we also showed that induced those T cell responses 
And importantly, we showed that it would induce strong responses in age animal, age animals, indicating that we would be able to potentially uh, vaccinate the elderly with this uh, vaccine. Here's just uh, latest data up to date. These are those non-human primates that were immunized. And you can see that out to now six months after the immunization, we're seeing a sustained antibody response in these animals, which is really exciting because as I mentioned, we're gonna want an, a vaccine that's able to induce uh, a durable immunity in the population. And so one of the other ways that we are working on, as I mentioned, is this uh, needle-free technology of getting DNA and RNA uh, into cells. Uh, this is called a gene gun, and it's developed in collaboration with Orlance, a biotech company I co-founded. And what it involves is really formulating the DNA and RNA onto gold nanoparticles and using a, a delivery device to actually do micro injections into the epidermis of the skin. So this is a needle-free delivery and it's pain-free. It has been tested in clinical trials and could enable self-administration. Importantly, DNA as well as RNA formulae and these gold nanoparticles are stable at room temperature and so could enable a worldwide distribution. So this is sort of shown an example in vitro. We're delivering DNA here and RNA here with the gene gun. And one of the striking things you notice is that there's a lot more uh, cells expressing the RNA here than in the DNA. That makes sense because the DNA has to get in the nucleus. The RNA just has to get into the, into the cytoplasm. However, we're finding that the DNA, these few cells will express the antigen much longer than the RNA. And so we're in the process right now of comparing DNA and RNA vaccines delivered by gene gun to see which one may be more immunogenic. And so uh, going into clinical development, there's always this big question about how long does it take? You know, so we've seen uh, the RNA vaccines and now the uh, adenovirus-based vaccines all are being developed within a year after we first uh, identify the sequence of the pathogen of the virus. Uh, but traditionally, uh, vaccines had always taken, uh, from the time that you actually made the vaccine, it can take up to five years to get through phase one, two, and three clinical trials. And that's just because these clinical trials were done by you first do the phase one trial, and then you wait to get the results, and then you start the phase two, and then you start the phase three after completing the phase two. What we're doing that's quite different now because we really needed an accelerated uh, development of these vaccine is to basically overlap these phase one, phase two, and three clinical trials. So the phase one clinical trial started, and then once we had sufficient safety data, the phase two uh, trial started and they overlap one another and, and so on with the phase three. The manufacturing of the vaccine actually started as soon as you had the initial proof of concept that it's gonna work in humans. And so one of the important things to note though is that none of the safety tests are skipped here. We're still doing all of the safety tests all the way through phase one, two, and three clinical trials, just as we had always done. But where is the, the here is a massive scale up of these vaccines occur quite early. So if for some reason the phase two or three clinical trials indicate the vaccine isn't efficacious or it's not as safe as it meets the safety criteria, then you would have a whole bunch of vaccine in uh, warehouses just stored up and have to be thrown away. So it's either licensed or busted. So that's really how we got to this point where we're looking at at least two companies and possibly four being able to release uh, 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 vaccines within a year after the virus uh, outbreak. So where are we now? We're looking at a whole bunch of different uh, vaccines in various phases of clinical trials. Remember these ones in phase one, like ours, are, are what we would call second wave vaccines that may address shortcomings of some of the leading vaccines. But we're very excited to see not only Moderna and Pfizer, but there's uh, AstraZeneca as well as J&J &J that are quickly uh, accelerating vaccines and we anticipate they'll get um, uh, licensed for use very soon. So I do wanna emphasize that when we talk about COVID-19 vaccines, often people think about vaccines as something that's gonna protect you from getting infection. But vaccines really protect us in three different ways. They protect us from infection. In other words, they prevent uh, that virus from getting in our cells. They can protect us from disease. That means a person could potentially get infected but the vaccine induces immune responses that pre prevents that virus from uh, pr progressing to disease or you, the individual might get vaccinated and would have normally had uh, severe disease, but that vaccine is able to protect them from uh, getting a severe disease. 
The other issue is, of course, very important for shutting down this pandemic is that regardless of whether your vaccine protects you from infection or disease, the important thing is that the, the vaccine will reduce the amount of virus that you're shedding and that will help to protect from transmission in the population. And so when the FDA came out with requirements for COVID-19 vaccine, there's two main things. They have to be safe and they have to be effective. For safety, they have to have a minimum of two months of follow-up. They have to have only mild to moderate reactogenicity. And one thing that's important is that you have to remember that if you got a sore arm, that actually probably indicates the vaccine is working. So reactogenicity is a normal part of vaccines, but you can't have vaccine associated adverse events, major issues that are gonna put you in the hospital and no evidence of enhancement of disease. The efficacy was set at 50% efficacy and I'll, I'll explain why that was in a minute. But the important thing about the, the criteria is that all of the uh, developers needed to document a minimum number of cases to demonstrate efficacy. And in the case of both Moderna as well as Pfizer, they had to show that their vaccine was protecting not just from infection, but also an additional uh, positive for one to two symptoms. So what that covers is that it's showing efficacy in protection from disease, not necessarily infection. And so far Pfizer and Moderna are reporting greater than 90%, so way ahead of what we had even hoped for. They also need to document a minimum number of severe cases. And that's important from the, for, for, from the perspective of where are those severe cases? Are they in your placebo group or in the vaccine group? If they're mostly in the placebo group, then that would tell you that the vaccine is also protecting from severe disease. And so once we have these vaccines, how are they gonna get used to stop a pandemic and who's gonna get it first? Well, in my lab, it's always the mice that get it the first, of course. Um, but there, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about this because the next big hurdle uh, for vaccine development is vaccine distribution. And so getting a vaccine into billions of people is really gonna be a challenge. Um, as we know, uh, a lot of companies are going to be going forward with an emergency use authorization. And so you're going to have these frontline health workers and first responders and high risk groups are going to be the first people to receive this uh, vaccine. And importantly, I just want to emphasize just kind of in a, you know, a couple last slides here is that to shut down the pandemic, we, uh, we can make a highly effective vaccine, something that's over 80% efficacy, but it's going to require people to take it. And in this case, it's estimated that we're going to need at least 55 to 60% of the population get immunized to be able to stop the pandemic. In addition, we need a combination of not just vaccination, but you got to continue to wear your mask and social distance uh, to help to accelerate the timeline to stop uh, that pandemic. And for sure, this coming mass vaccination will be something we've never seen before. It'll be unprecedented. And I just want to close here with just showing you this picture of my son. He's an archer and he won a national championship here, uh, as you can see with his arrows. And what I want to emphasize here is he never got one arrow exactly in the middle. And this is to emphasize a point that I don't, it's not going to be one vaccine that's going to shut down the pandemic. So we're going to need five to seven effective vaccines that will likely work together to stop the pandemic because each vaccine has potential gaps and the others will be able to fill in uh, for, for each other. So, uh, so with that, I just want to just give some acknowledgments, particularly with two po uh, really talented postdocs in my lab, Megan O'Connor and Jesse Erasman, who are at the forefront of developing the RNA and DNA vaccines for COVID-19 in our lab, as well as many of my other uh, collaborators. And uh, thank you for your attention. Deb, thank you very much for that. Very clear uh, and a lot of fascinating science that uh, you just went over. There's a lot of questions in the chat box, or sorry, in the Q&A box. Maybe while Annerbon's speaking, you can have a look at some of those just to prep yourself uh, and I'll come back and ask them. Um, uh, and a reminder to the participants, if you have a question either for Deb or Annerbon, uh, please type it into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen there. And uh, we'll have a Q&A session once uh, Annerbon is finished. So uh, now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Arban Basu. Dr. Basu is professor and the Sturgatis Family Endowed Director of the Choice Institute, which is located in the School of Pharmacy. And he holds joint appointments in the uh, Departments of Health Services and the Department of Economics at the University of Washington. Uh, Arban is a pharmacist, a health economist, and a statistician. Uh, and he specializes in research on comparative and cost effectiveness 
causal inference and program evaluation. Tonight, he will illustrate the funding lines and the pricing structures that are in place to make a vaccine accessible to our community and globally. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anurban Basu. Anurban, over to you. Well, thank you, Sean, uh, and thank you to, for the School of Pharmacy for this opportunity to present in front of you. Um, I'm grateful to be able to share the stage with Dr. Fuller. It was an excellent presentation. Um, I thank Phil and Sandra Noodleman for being such a great supporter of our school, and it's a great honor to present this seminar named after your family. I was asked to talk about vaccine pricing, especially as it relates to the upcoming vaccines for COVID-19. So I take this opportunity today to highlight how economics can play a crucial complementary role to basic science for vaccine development and use, and how the synergy is in full display during the current pandemic. Next slide, please. So as we all know, COVID-19 pandemic has had tremendous effect on human health. A recent study estimated what COVID mortality rates mean for the US population. It shows that on average, COVID-19, despite being mostly fatal for older age groups, have reduced average life expectancy at birth by 1.13 years. That is a reduction corresponding to moving our average health back by almost two decades. In fact, these reductions are highly disparate among racial and ethnic groups further increasing the inequalities that already existed. Next slide. In the last few weeks, um, including this week, and as Dr. Fuller said, we got some much needed good news. Preliminary data suggests that both Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine in phase three trials shows signs of being over 90% effective. And many other vaccines are in phase three. It's important to step back and appreciate what a remarkable achievement this is. The potential to get an effective vaccine against a new coronavirus within a year of a start of a pandemic. Next slide. To understand this marvel, let's take a look at the US vaccine market. The vaccine market typically is a tiny fraction of the overall pharma market. It's about $18 billion compared to pharma's $500 billion. And um, in fact, this vaccine market, it's, uh, it's characterized by very high failure rate. Only about 6% of the vaccine candidates come to the market. It takes about 11 years on average for an average vaccine to come to the market. It is also highly concentrated. In the US, about five companies supply almost 100% of all vaccines. There is continuous manufacturing unpredictability and involves large fixed costs of distribution that often leads to shortages. Overall, vaccine markets are relatively less attractive to private R&D investments. And therefore, research in many of these areas are driven by public dollars. But the deficiencies in the vaccine market goes beyond just R&D. Next slide. The economics of infectious disease primarily relies on public policy or the lack of them uh, that facilitates development of vaccine, setting the correct price, and enhance distribution. Many considerations come into play, uh, including R&D costs, effectiveness, safety, production cost, value considerations, communications, and equity. Next slide. In the US, what is most telling, I think if you could go back one more slide. Uh, in the US, what is more telling is that unlike the pharma sector, where formal negotiation on prices by the government is often sought for by the economist. For vaccines, where the market incentives are weak, the feds run the market on vaccine prices and purchase. Next slide. For example, in the US, CDC contracts vaccine prices for public buyers once a vaccine has been developed using standard framework of cost and benefits. However, CDC posts these negotiated prices from multiple bidders but does not enter into a volume-based contract with these bidders. Instead, state and local governments receive budgets for vaccines to purchase the vaccine at these negotiated prices. 
Now, because of the idiosyncrasies and unpredictability of the uptake of vaccines, especially adult vaccines, manufacturers' revenues suffer. Next slide. Here is a snapshot of the vaccine prices posted on the CDC website. As you can see, negotiated prices for the public programs are set much lower than in the private sector, but the quantity supplied is often not guaranteed. Next slide. In many instances, reform has been sought regarding the financing of vaccines. An Institute of Medicine, which is now known as the National Academies of Medicine, report made several recommendations, including the need for additional financial incentive to encourage development of vaccines. And it highlighted the importance of accounting for the full societal benefits to estimate the vaccine's price. Next slide. In sum, the US market for vaccine is archaic. There is not enough incentive for attracting new investments. For example, the US R&D investments for the development of a Zika vaccine were almost entirely public. Yet globally, there has been an increased recognition of public-private partnership for developing vaccines. A classic example was a partnership between the Global Alliance of Vaccine Innovation, Gavi, and Merck that led to the innovation of the Ebola vaccine in 2018. More recently, SETI has engaged with several industry partners to develop vaccines across a variety of diseases. Next slide. So how does an effective public-private partnership looks like? Here I'm going to talk a little bit about some basic economics concepts to set the stage for COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. The key feature that drives an effective partnership is the classic trade-off in health economics on how to provide sufficient incentive for innovation and also generate sufficient value in the short run. Economic theory says that in the case of vaccine, one important feature by which this trade-off can be achieved is to preset prices instead of trying to negotiate prices after a vaccine is developed. This is achievable in case of vaccine because the value of vaccine of different efficacy can also often be predicted. Moreover, we should be able to assure a predictable demand through procurement targets. So basically preset prices or preset revenue to attract investment. But then the question is, how do we determine what price to preset for a vaccine? Next slide. To answer this question, economics uses the concept of welfare. We know that the vaccine for a disease creates social welfare, which is the total net value in the society. It's net of paying for the cost of manufacturing the uh, vaccine, but all the benefits accrue to that value. Now, this total social value can be split into two parts. One that is appropriated by the producer through its profits and the rest that accrues to the rest of our society. Note that for a given efficacy of a vaccine, the total social value is constant. It's a knowable quantity through good modeling exercise. Next slide. So how does the channel of effect flows? It flows as follows. As preset prices increases, it increases financial incentive for private R&D, which in turn increases the chance of finding a vaccine. Next slide. Which means that even if the total social welfare for vaccine is constant, the expected total social welfare before the vaccine is developed, that expectation, which is a product of the chance of getting the vaccine to the market times the total social welfare, increases as preset prices increases. What is not clear though, is what is the right split of these expected total surplus between the provider profits and the remaining consumer surplus. As preset prices increases, we are guaranteeing an increased share of these total surplus or total welfare to provider profits. There are many ways to address this problem depending on what the decision maker, often many times the government, preferences are. Next slide. The key intuition from economic theory is that if preset prices are too low, of course profits will be low, but so will be the total expected welfare because the chance of getting a vaccine would be lower too. 
If the preset prices are too high, expected total welfare will be high, but most of it would go to the provider as profit. So the idea would be to come somewhere in between to err on the side of higher preset prices, but to restrain profits to be within certain percentage of total welfare. Next slide. Economic theory also addresses many other aspects of vaccine development and distribution process and makes some key recommendations. Obviously, it encourages that there should be a public-private investment to accelerate vaccine development. Government should procure targets in order to guarantee demand. It should set a penalty for failing to meet these production cap capacities. It should invest in manufacturing capacities, invest in distribution capacities, capabilities, and preset price according to our previous discussion. Next slide. So let's see how these insights translated to COVID-19 vaccine development. Next slide. Among the many public health debacles that this current administration has committed during this pandemic, Operation Warp Speed is not one of them. Operation Warp Speed is one of the most influential public policy in the vaccine space made in the US in a long time. Its goal is to produce and deliver 300 million doses of safe and effective vaccine with the initial doses available by January, 2021. And as a part of the broader strategy to accelerate development, manufacturing and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics. Next slide. Keeping aside the politics of how this operation was funded and supervised, let's see what the Operation Warp Speed did from the economics perspective. It started a public-private investment of about $18 billion, contracted with manufacturers to procure 300 million doses. Whether any penalty was set to meet these targets were not known but it did invest about $1.5 billion in manufacturing capacity, including glass vials and other essentials. It contracted with McKesson as a central distributor who also distributed the H1N1 vaccine. But interestingly, Operation Warp Speed did not preset a price. In fact, it allowed for free pricing of the vaccines for all producers. And it invested in a portfolio of innovations giving 3 billion to NIH and about 11.25 billion to seven other private com uh, companies. The goal was to have multiple effective vaccines within a year. One may ask why not use preset prices as economic theory would have told us to do so. Next slide. To understand why Operation uh, Warp Speed did not set pre preset or create preset prices, Let's look at the total social benefits of eliminating COVID-19. Last month, David Cutler and Larry Summers, uh, two of the very preeminent um, economists, provided the first economy-wide burden estimate of pandemic, uh, of this pandemic, and estimated the economic cost of COVID-19 to be about $16 trillion. These costs included losses due to lost GDP, health loss due to premature death, long-term health impairment, mental health impairment. Next slide. However, these estimates were reported in October. Operations Warp Speed needed these estimates to preset prices in March. At that time, total welfare was expected to be large, but also quite uncertain. In any case, there was considerable decision uncertainty around what would be an appropriate preset price. Most likely, as theory would su suggest, any preset price would have been very high on the higher side, and that would have overwhelmed the healthcare budgets. So instead, Operation Warp Speed allowed manufacturers to free price, uh, uh, price freely, which is different from what uh, the US feds do for other vaccines. And so they are allowed to free price, uh, price freely, just like in pharma, um, and one of the reason uh, Pfizer refused the o Operation Warp Suite's investment and decided to develop a vaccine with its own funds. But the operation strategy to mitigate price was to rely on competition. The idea was that if one of these development is successful, there's a good chance that the others would be too, 
and that would naturally create a downward pressure on price in the market. And this is exactly how it is playing out today. Next slide. More recently, CMS also set out some rules to acquire and distribute these vaccines. Um, of course, the feds will purchase the batch of vaccine uh, produce, uh, procre that is procured and distribute them. Uh, CMS has proposed to cover all costs regarding the receipt of vaccine. However, there are some complications regarding this uh, in, in context of the emergency use um, uh, kind of designation that are being currently worked out. It set Medicare payment for administration and even proposed to cover these costs for the uninsured. Next slide. The manufacturer's responses was, were expected. You know, Pfizer, which did not take the operations money, did say that they do plan to make some profits from their COVID-19 vaccine. Even Moderna, which took the operations money, said the same. Other manufacturers like Janssen committed to pricing their vaccine at marginal cost. It is not surprising and also perfectly acceptable for these private developers to make some profits. Any public-private partnership whose design would warrant them to the private manufacturers. The key here is that instead of the government deciding how much profit they should make, the market would set the profit levels through competition. Next slide. So overall, a back of the envelope calculation shows that the cost of the COVID vaccine would amount to about $21 billion, including the dose and the administration. This basically doubles the vaccine expenditure in the US, but still a bargain given what the what at stake in terms of the pandemic. In fact, it is expected that this cost would go down as more vaccines enter the market and there is more competition created. Next slide. In conclusion, um, Operation Warp Speed ushered in an era in the US where it showcased that vaccine development can be facilitated through public-private partnership. While different forms of these partnerships exist, the key to designing and successful partnership relies having, on having sufficient financial incentive for private R&D and also setting up for these investments to compete with private investors and also for the public R&D. It also highlights the need to develop appropriate disease models that can capture the full societal benefits of the, of the vaccine, um, something that our institute are especially specializes on. So in sum, we hope that such initiatives, you won't see the last of such initiatives, and these initiatives would be increasingly used for the development of other vaccines, both in the US and elsewhere. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Great, Anurban, thank you very much for that. Uh, very instructive. And Deb, if you can come back on, there you go, terrific. So um, uh, this is uh, terrific. Thank you both for sharing your time, your expertise with us. And now what I'd like to do is uh, begin to share with you some of the questions um, that have been submitted. And uh, those of you in the audience, if you wanna still submit questions, feel free. Um, I can tell you both that there are over 65 questions in the Q&A box. Um, uh, Danielle on our team is uh, collating them, putting together. We're going to go back and forth between the two of you. Um, and then if we don't get to some of them, I'm going to work with you and, and I'm going to help uh, provide response to some of these questions that we'll then post along with the video of the session uh, afterwards so that we can attempt to address all the questions. I've looked at them and they're, they're wide ranging and varied and, and they include some of the topics that uh, you've touched upon and, and uh, some of the attendees are asking for additional clarification, et cetera. So, but let's, um, uh, let's start. Um, I'm gonna start with a question for you, Deb, which has to do with cl the clinical trial development program for vaccines, uh, particularly phase three. Um, and there, there are a few questions in the chat box or the Q&A box about a representation of the volunteers that are in there. Do, uh, do, do the participants in these trials include the high risk patients? So the elderly, the nursing home patients, do they include healthcare providers uh, who are likely to be some of the first to get the vaccines or people with underlying diseases? And if not, 
how do we determine whether vaccines are actually safe in those populations? What a great question. So yes, the phase three trials do uh, include a wide range of demographics. So we have to remember when we start with a phase one, a clinical trial will first start with healthy young adults. And as they move into phase two, that's when they start to enroll other demographics like the elderly and people with underlying conditions. By the time they hit phase three, they are required to have a representation of a wide range of demographics, including the elderly, including people with underlying conditions, racially diverse, male and female. And so all of these phase three trials, which generally were uh, between 10 and 40,000 uh, volunteers, will have a broad representation of different um, demographics. One thing that they don't initially include, and this is important, um, is that uh, the, the initial trials don't include children. They're adults usually. And so that's just our, our instincts as to protect our children. We're gonna test vaccines uh, first in the adults, unless of course it's a vaccine that is for children. Um, but in, for this particular vaccine, we start with the adults and all of the um, uh, companies like Pfizer and Moderna have already filed and started to enroll in children. So once they saw that it was safe in adults, they started to enroll children, uh, you know, now I, I think down to 12 years old and they are being enrolled in the clinical trials as well. So definitely diverse and we don't, haven't seen all the data yet. So we don't know whether that 90 some percent efficacy is that gonna be different in different demographics? That's just taking everybody into account at this point. Great, thank you for that answer, Deb. Uh, Anurban, to you now, uh, is there concern about free market pricing in that one of the main groups that could potentially benefit the most and ultimately contribute to herd immunity uh, would uh, essential workers might be the ones that don't have insurance or can't afford the treatment? Well, I know, I mean, obviously that's a very US centric uh, kind of uh, kind of situation that we are in that we have so many uninsured patients and one of the thing that was interesting to see that CMS came out and say that it would be covering the cost of all people who receive this vaccine even if they're uninsured um, but there are hurdles there are uh, friction costs basically associated with accessing these and and to what extent um, you know, if ACA goes away, we're going to have more and more of these people in the market. So um, I think it's a responsibility of our, um, uh, of our uh, kind of uh, elected officials to make sure that the health insurance is available to the majority of the population, if not all, and especially essential health care is accessible to most of our population. Great, thank you. Uh, Deb, now to you. Um, so the two questions. One is why not make a vaccine that is both RNA and DNA to get both rapid and long-term benefits in the same vaccine? And thinking about long-term benefits, can you speak to the issue of durability? Yeah, what a great question. We are actually testing that right now in our lab. We, uh, who, whoever brought up that question, that's a, a subject of a whole grant application <laughs> that was recently awarded. And we're, we're actually looking at that of co-delivering DNA and RNA or priming with DNA and then boosting with RNA. Uh, we're seeing some promising results with that. So that again, one of those sort of second uh, generation type of vaccines where uh, it could combine the best, best of both worlds. Uh, and, and so to, to the question about durability, I mean, that's a big question. We just don't know yet. And, you know, because all these vaccines were developed within a year, how durable is that immunity going to, to be? That's something that we're looking at, obviously, in uh, preclinical studies. We do know immunologically that T helper cells, T follicular help cells in particular play a key role in sustaining immune memory. So we have a lot of basic research where we understand what what helps memory last for a long time and help to make the uh, responses more durable. And in our lab, we're working on modifications to our RNA and DNA vaccines to, to tweak that and hopefully enable more durable immunity. Well, let, let me just follow up with that and ask you this question. Are you optimistic about durability with the current vaccines? I, I, I to some extent, Yes, and it depends on the vaccine that we're talking about. So, uh, but it, it, it's hard to know 
because we only started doing experiments in January. And I, for example, have animals that I immunized in March. So I only have six months of data yeah. to know that for sure. Okay. Now, based on other types of vaccines, because all of these vaccines had been uh, being developed for other infectious diseases, I can be optimistic about that because they've demonstrated, say, for influenza, for MERS, they've had clinical trials ongoing for years with those vaccine technologies, and they're seeing uh, some sustained immunity. But I, I do have to give a caveat that it really does depend to some extent on the immunogen or the pathogen you're talking about. I've seen some antigens short term immunity and some long-term immunity and the mechanisms underlying that are we're only just starting to understand. Great. Thank you for that. Anurban, now to you. Um, the distribution process, right? So we've got these uh, potentially fabulous vaccines about ready to get emergency approval from the FDA. Uh, and now we're going to wrestle with the issue of distribution. So speak to this, speak to the issue of distribution and and how you see that playing out uh, yeah. in the US? That's a very important question. Obviously, you know, nothing will happen if you don't get the vaccine. Um, I think there are two things here. One is the rate at which a manufacturer can actually produce these vaccines. Uh, I think what I'm hearing is that only about 40 to 60 million doses will be available um, uh, maybe in March, April, May. And, and the 300 million that, that was procured, I mean, that will take the whole year to get there. Uh, and then there's a second question. Once you produce that, how do you distribute it to different states and you know, um, keep them safe and then kind of give them the right? And uh, so the technology, like with the Pfizer vaccine, with needing like minus 70 degrees or whatever, you know, that's a technology that exists, but it's costly. And, and, and to what extent that could be scaled up uh, across states is, remains to be seen. I think in, in that sense, the Moderna vaccine may be uh, in a better bet, although it might come out a little later. But there are, you know, the, uh, the National Academies of Medicine kind of came out with these phase, phase kind of distribution, um, really to prioritize who should be getting the first batch of vaccine and who should be getting the next batch of vaccine and so forth, based on vulnerability, their role in the economy and all, 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 all sorts of um, kind of characteristics. The one thing I would say is that there are three, three features that closely interplay in, in figuring out what will happen during over 2021 uh, when these vaccines are being produced and distributed. One is how fast they can be manufactured and distributed. The second is who gets them. And the third is what happens to the rest of the economy uh, among those who did not get them. Um, right. So you, you, can, you can give, you can vaccinate, uh, you know, a, a small section of the, of, the, uh, of the population. But if you broadly open up like before the rest of the section of the population, is the transmission high enough to be still kind of producing that effect on those who are, who are vaccinated, but still has a small chance of getting infected. So I think it's a balance between all those three things. And, but ultimately, I think by the end of 2021, the hope is that we would have sufficient vaccination done to at least think about approaching some kind of herd immunity, at least for a year um, at that point. Yeah. And I heard you say, Deb, that we need to vaccinate about 60% to achieve herd immunity. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's so, a projected estimates. Yes. Yeah. So um, there's, um, you know, I, listening to your presentation and thinking about the fact that they're, they're not only, you know, scientists and medical specialists on the, this call, but also uh, members of the lay public. You know, there's a question that comes up about, you know, uh, if there's going to be five, six, seven, eight vaccines available, how do they choose? Yeah, that's a great question. So the five, six, seven vaccines, uh, let me let me just say for sure that when I, I've looked at all the phase two and phase one data and when Pfizer first announced their data and then Moderna shortly after that, that got me excited, not just for those two typical particular vaccines, 
but the next three to five that are coming after them because their phase one, phase two data, their preclinical data, they all align. They're inducing very comparable immune responses. So when Pfizer said they were getting in 90 plus uh, percent efficacy, that gave us all a lot of confidence that all of the vaccines are likely going to have similar degrees of efficacy. And so then it comes down to, okay, you're going to have all these vaccines start to roll out. Obviously, if you're in the high risk group, you're going to have a more limited choice because those would be the first vaccines that would get rolled out. But as we get more and more vaccines out, we begin to get a better understanding of various things like, for example, uh, you know, if some vaccines may be more effective in the elderly than other ones. And so another type of vaccine uh, might be able to stimulate immunity quicker. And so it might come down to, hey, you know, well, I'm over 65 and it looks like the adenovirus-based vaccines are not working as well in the elderly. So your physician's going to work with you and they're going to have that data and information and be able to say, hey, this is going to be the better vaccine for your particular demographic. So I think as more data rolls out, we'll have a better understanding as to what types of vaccines work in, in, in different demographics. Great. So, Anurban, I'm going to follow that up with a question for you, which is, if uh, no one vaccine may be the magic bullet for everybody, so, uh, and as Deb, you said, each vaccine may actually cover some gap, right, in coverage. Taking that into consideration, so how do we expect that, that fact to encourage competition and thus drive prices down if all these vaccines have a specific niche? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the idea of competition is that these products are to some extent substitutable. And, um, and, and if, if it shows that a certain demographics, a certain population only responds to one vaccine and none of the other vaccines work from them for them, the manufacturers do have some... Um, leeway to increase prices. And, and the key there is, is the hope that we would have enough vaccine candidates so that we would have at least some um, substitute available if that's the case. I mean, that's why when we do a public-private partnership, the key, the, the real dilemma is to whether, you know, let's set prices from beginning so it doesn't matter later on, um, you know, what happens. But on the other hand, if you set prices from the beginning, then later on, if there are multiple things, multiple options that come up, there is no way to reduce those prices because you've already set the prices from before. Yeah. So it's kind of the, those dilemma that you face in doing these partnerships. Uh, very good. Uh, good answer. Um, Deb, let's, uh, let, let's face now the question that many people in the US and across the world are thinking about now with respect to these vaccines. And that has to do with safety. Right, and uh, not only safety, but uh, concern about uncertainty as it relates to the potential of these vaccines to cause perhaps harmful effects uh, five, 10 years from now, particularly if they're given to children, right? So, so could you address that broad set of question? Because there's probably, I would guess 20% of the questions in the Q&A box are all around safety? That's a really important question. And, you know, I, I want to emphasize that when you look at the, the data, vaccine, not just COVID-19 vaccines, but vaccines historically, that when we talk about and concern about safety for vaccines, the majority of the safety issues uh, or potential adverse events or reactogenicity, that usually occurs within months after the immunization, it's actually quite, quite rare. And I, I'm trying to rack my brain for an example of a vaccine that causes an issue five, 10 years down, down the line. So when we're talking about real major safety issues with vaccines, usually they become apparent within the first few weeks, if not months uh, after the immunization. And that's why when the FDA establishes, um, you know, establishes a safety criteria for these particular vaccines, they asked for two months of follow-up because that's the window of time where 99.9% .9 of any safety issues associated with vaccines are going to appear. You pass that two-month period of time, it will be very rare uh, to have any sort of adverse event that would occur years and years later. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Anurban, I want to turn to you now and talk to you about 
uh, an issue that you know many of us have read about or thought about in the last few months, and that has to do with trust uh, in our institutions, specifically the FDA. Right? Mm -hmm. um, there's there's a view that uh, our federal agencies like the FDA and the CDC have been become hyper politicized, and that has had a negative impact on uh, trust of the American people. So if the FDA is going to make the final determination, um, can the American people trust that that decision was made by scientists and not through some uh, goofy political process? And I, I ask you to think about that and to comment on that. And Deb, maybe you can do the same actually. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I wanna remark that there are a few states around uh, the country that have indicated, in, including the state of Washington, that there's going to be a, an additional review uh, in our state of Washington before the vaccines can actually come in. Does that make sense to you? Does that uh, delay access to these essential vaccines? So if you can just, I'll let you start on Urban and then Deb will yeah. we'll have you address the same thing. Yeah, I mean, uh... I think historically, if you do, if pe when people have done a survey of the American population about asking them whether they're going to take vaccine, historically, they always have come back with very low numbers. I mean, the polio vaccine, I think when they did, uh, I think 60% said they're going to take up the vaccine. And ultimately, what happened after the polio vaccine came, about 100% of most of the population took the vaccine. Um, this is obviously a very unique uh, situation, unique time, unique political experience, and a pa unique pandemic experience. Um, and uh, what we have seen is since Jan uh, since February, um, since the start of the pandemic, um, the confidence that American people have that whether they're going to take the vaccine has been dwindling down slowly. Uh, I think it was like 80% in March, it's now at 66%. I think there's a recent, like, I think today there's a JAMA article that came out on that. Um, now, you know, I think things would have been a lot more trickier if the vaccine did come out before the elections. Uh, you know, the Project Warp Speed, the name was an unfortunate name. It kind of, it kind of, kind of signaled that, you know, something is rushed uh, and brought to the American public without proper supervision. Um, but I think our institutions held true. Uh, I think the FDA is doing fair diligence to see that the right um, uh, data on efficacy and safety are there. Uh, uh, I mean, it's driven by career um, kind of uh, public officials, scientists. And, and so the hope is once that data is available and, and everybody to see, uh, we would have a much more um, kind of confidence in that data, in those results, and, and go from there. And I think one thing that FDA can certainly do in these cases is really make those clinical trial data public um, yeah. so that it could be scrutinized well across by scientists throughout the world. Transparency will be real important here. Absolutely. Deb, how about, how about your views? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think uh, it doesn't you know, it, it doesn't hurt to have another set of eyes. So, you know, have these states saying, hey, we're going to look at it if that helps to mitigate the politicization of, uh, of these vaccines. Because, I mean, vaccines are, you can make a vaccine, and it can be 90% effective, but if people don't take it, it's not going to work. Okay, yeah. you have, uh, vaccines don't save lives, immunization save lives. So you have to get people convinced to take it. And if you go to people and say, hey, we got this vaccine for COVID-19, you're gonna take it. Uh, yeah, they might have hesitancy if they don't know what the data looks like, if they haven't got people who they trust telling them that it's safe and, and effective. And so if you've got another round of eyes looking at that and providing some assurance, and I think that could help to uh, reduce vaccine hesitancy, I think that's going, uh, going to be really important, you know, provided that it doesn't delay things. We can't, you know, have this, you know, things delay in terms of getting these vaccines to people. And my understanding is that the, the uh, transparency is going to, you know, I mean, I'm seeing the data now, even as we speak. So, uh, so they are being, have been one of the most transparent processes uh, in terms of development of vaccines has been with this COVID-19 vaccine. So I, I think that it's not a bad idea. 
Okay, I'm going to finish uh, with one last question, which is going to ask the two of you to put your crystal ball hat on and uh, answer the question that the whole world wants to know, which is if these vaccines are 95 plus percent effective and we're able to get them into people, um, when do you think we're all going to be returning to a normal life? Deb, let's start with you. Well, that really depends on the population. So uh, people, if they're going to be responsive to uh, the vaccination campaigns and uh, get their vaccines, and that's coupled with uh, the continuing the social distancing and wearing masks, that's going to be important for two reasons. Number one, it's going to take months and months of time to vaccinate sufficient number of people to achieve herd immunity. And during that time, we still have to, you know, use all the weapons that we have uh, in store for us to slow down this transmission. And then secondly, remember these are back, most of these vaccines are two doses. It's gonna take you at least eight weeks to build up sufficient protective immunity. So we all have to, if we wear the masks and we continue social distance, and then we add in the additional weapon of vaccination, we're looking at really accelerating that timeline, potentially even by next year uh, at this time, we could start to, you know, it'll be like a, a, a distant memory in a sense. But the, the less we participate in the immunization and the less that we arm ourselves with all those weapons, including the mass and social distance, distancing, it will eventually, uh, vaccination will, will eventually build up a herd immunity. It will just take a lot longer. So it really depends on the population, on the people uh, stepping up and, and everybody working together to, to um, you know, the last piece is each individual playing a role in helping to stop the pandemic. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Honorban, you have the last opportunity to well, you know, yeah, no, I, I, I obviously agree with everybody, everything that Dr. Fuller said about that. Uh, you know, the one thing I would say is that, you know, there is a time lag between obviously when we would get the vaccine actually rolled out to me and when I get the uh, immunization. But the fact that there is a very effective vaccine on the horizon increases the option value of all the preventive measures that we are doing today. Yeah. Masking, social distancing. You know, because we really want to live or be healthy to actually accrue the benefits of that vaccine. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, obviously, hopefully by the end of 2021, we should be back to normalcy. But back to normalcy may not mean the normalcy we had before. Sure. Right? I think we would be much more vigilant about our public health uh, behaviors and, and also uh, you know, this this is not a one-time affair. I mean, like influenza, we might have to actually take annual vaccines for COVID-19, maybe clubbed with our flu vaccines that we, we should continue to take. Right. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I appreciate you joining us, sharing your expertise today. I uh, also want to thank my team in the School of Pharmacy for organizing this event particularly Maddie and Claire have been working behind the scenes. And of course, a special thank you to Phil and Sandy Noodleman for their generous support of this uh, annual lecture. And I wanna thank all of you who attended. We uh, at the height had 380 participants. Um, hopefully by uh, this time next year, uh, we might be able to participate again in person. That's, I, I sort of heard that that may happen, but if not, <laughs> Uh, we'll be here with another fantastic lecture. But until that time, please continue to practice safe public health measures, wash your hands, wear a mask, and stay six feet apart. Thank you again for this evening. And it, it's, uh, it's great to have had you all participate. We will be posting this lecture um, uh, and we'll, we will be answering many of the questions that we didn't get to. And, and make sure that those are available to everyone. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great evening.